words about just brainstorming since 99% of you never moved. Um, Jesse was born in 1909, long time ago. He graduated from Harvard in astronomy. And uh, his first job, he, he got a uh, fellowship <coughs> for <coughs> two year fellowship at Yerkes Observatory, which is uh, in Wisconsin um, and known by the University of Chicago. Uh, in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. <clears throat> he uh, was hired by Caltech in 1948, I believe, from York East to establish an astronomy department at Caltech. Prior to that, there was only one person who you might imagine was an astronomer, and uh, nothing was going on. Jesse worked became came as the director of a new program in astronomy and was given appointments and people he could hire and things like that. And uh, that was in, in 1948. Uh, during, well, during World War II, Jesse worked uh, for the military on confidential matters. And that was actually quite useful to him later, knowing all these people, because they had money and he, they were very satisfied with, with whatever he did for them, which I don't know what it was, but they were very satisfied. And so in his future, if he needed money, he could go over to his military friends and get it very quickly. <laughs> so they were very happy. Uh, during World War II, as I said, he did secret consulting with the military. And um, he invented a wide field camera and various other things. Um, and in, um, let's see, Jay, I can't remember the date. In 1948, he was hired. Prior to that, there was only one person with a PhD in astronomy on the faculty. And he wasn't really the right person to be the director of everything. So um, one of the things that Jesse did was that he introduced radio astronomy. Prior to his interest in radio astronomy, it wasn't uh, considered very relevant. And he built up the faculty. Um, the only person that initially was Fritz with and Jesse hired anybody else. He uh, admitted women, which was not true when I applied to Princeton. Women were not admitted to graduate school. Uh, there were three or four of us at that time, and that was a lot. Every place else was like zero. And he he uh, he created the a an astronomy department that was vibrant, that was friendly, and I think people liked it. <laughs> but for me personally, he was very kind to me at various times in my in my ups and downs of life. And uh, I'm very grateful to him because he told me about the Pacific Asian Museum and their annual trips to Tibet, which they don't run anymore, obviously. Uh, my husband and I went to Tibet on one of those trips and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, he had dinners in his house, not very many, but a lot. And um, he was the department chair for many years. He uh, died in October of 2002. And, um, he was a, a wise and kind man. He had me to dinner in his house several times. And when I first arrived, I had a lot of problems, which I won't bother you with, but he was very understanding and tried to help. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Judy. Um, 
Well, thank you all, and great to see so many of you out. Uh, and welcome to uh, the the first Greenstein lecture uh, since before the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I got some very nice slides from from Sterl about Jesse Greenstein, but after Judy's introduction, I won't uh, go through uh, his history. But I can add a couple of pictures to, to uh, what Judy described. So uh, here he is. This is uh, uh, the Hale Observatory staff, and as Judy said, here's the you know, two Caltech astronomers, Ricky and uh, Jesse. So, um, uh, and uh, again, I won't go through this. Another, I think, uh, another thing he, he did that was very influential, uh, I think, implicit in some what Judy said was had the, the second ever decadal survey, uh, um, one of the most influential for you know, recommending many programs that. that Became reality. I thought it was the second, but oh, oh, sorry, yes, it was the first joint one, I guess. But there had been a previous NSF only one that was sort of a pilot, I guess. Was, uh, I think what I read, but others know better than me. So. Um, and I and Stroll had this great picture, I think. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yes. Something to strive for. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and this is uh, so we have this uh, invited lectureship and visitor series uh, in his memory um, and in his honor, and uh, 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 and we've had a number of speakers, uh, incredibly uh, uh, prestigious leaders in the field. Uh, listed here. Of course, I, I can't go through all of them. Uh, you can scan the names and it's a, a, a proud company and we're happy to have, uh, after a couple of years off because of the pandemic, uh, to have Lars join us for the uh, uh, 22nd Greenstein Lecture. I guess, I don't know if we should call them annual after a three-year hiatus, but uh, it's uh, uh, a privilege to have Lars here. Um, and I'll uh, just briefly introduce Lars uh, and then let him take over. Uh, so uh, uh, Lars uh, uh, originally comes from Princeton, but not like many astronomers from the school, but actually from the town. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, his uh, father was a, a physicist also, and uh, uh, father and mother both encouraged him in, uh, I guess, getting interested in astrophysics. Um, and then he went to, to Cornell for undergraduate uh, before coming to Caltech. Uh, which is obviously what gave him the, the skills to be such a you know, honorable uh, speaker uh, for his PhD. And he worked with Roger Blanford on his PhD uh, on neutron stars, um, but you know, uh, decided that uh, neutron stars weren't going to be really exciting until you know, 2020 or so. So he uh, switched uh, towards the end of that time to, to working on stellar dynamics. Um, and then went to uh, postdocs at, at Berkeley and then the IAS uh, before joining uh, Santa Cruz as, as a member of the faculty in 1990 um, and began uh, uh, something I'll mention again in a moment, advising a string of uh, people who become leaders in the field in their own right. Uh, some of his first students included folks like Catherine Johnson and Ramil DeVay there at Santa Cruz who become um, major leaders uh, in the field of uh, galactic archaeology uh, and extragalactic astronomy. Uh, um, he was poached uh, and moved to Harvard in 1998, where he's now the, the uh, I have no idea properly how to pronounce this. Malincrot. Malincrot, uh, thank you, professor of astrophysics. Uh, um, uh, and he's been awarded many prizes. I don't have the time or information to list all of them here, but uh, uh, among them, it's a member of the AAAS and NAS. And, and recently, some of these photos are from uh, he and Volker Springel, uh, who are both together in the top photo and together here in their Zoom version of the, uh, I guess this was the award ceremony on Zoom for the Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2020, uh, along with uh, Wendy Friedman, who we had here recently for colloquium, and uh, of course, uh, Martin Rees, who I guess is your academic grandfather. Um, right. He was Roger's advisor. Um, and here's uh, a picture from, a, I guess, a CFA picnic with Jim Moran and John Hooker. Uh, and John was 
around at the, the CFA. Um, and uh, scientifically, uh, Lars is, I, I can't just show nice pictures. Uh, uh, more embarrassing photos can be purchased later. But, um, Lars has made a, a number of major contributions to many fields, especially in extragalactic astronomy theory. Um, uh, and I'll just list some here. He'll only talk about uh, a small fraction of that, I'm sure, including things like the, the fueling of quasars, the growth and feedback from supermassive black holes and origin of black hole scaling relations, uh, sort of modeling feedback from stars uh, and really uh, played an instrumental role in bringing simulations of galaxy formation to the sort of modern form that they have and the revolution that's happened in the last couple of decades, uh, really building up uh, the idea of cosmological simulations as tools that can be used for things like uh, mock samples and direct tools for calibrating cosmological surveys. Uh, he's worked extensively on the dynamics of galaxy mergers and interactions and how uh, those lead to things like bulges and elliptical galaxies and different types of galactic structures and galactic dynamics. Uh, uh, he's also played a major role in numerical development, starting with uh, sort of tree SPH and then gadget and the gadget family tree of codes that includes uh, my code Gizmo, which was an offshoot originally of gadget and a repo. And uh, it's uh, quite literally the case that the sort of family tree of codes that, that you that Lars worked on, especially with Volker has been used for, for many thousands of papers. And I, I stress not cited in many thousands of papers, but it was the code that they used in many thousands of papers. Um, uh, and he's also worked again on uh, even larger scales in the IGM and my now forest and some of the first simulations that really made quantitative comparison uh, for Lyman alpha forest cosmology uh, possible. Um, and he's worked as well on 21 centimeter cosmology predictions for the organization and, and more. Um, and, and my interaction with Lars uh, was because he was my PhD advisor at the CFA when I was a graduate student uh, from 2004 to 2008. Um, uh, so in that little window of time, I was fortunate enough to work with Lars and a, a really fantastic group of people. And uh, these are a couple of photos from the top is from right after my uh, PhD defense. Um, and the bottom is the uh, graduation party uh, we had. So I'm in the very pink Harvard robes there. Um, and uh, I, I labeled people on the top because it was a really fantastic group. Uh, Elliot just happened to be in town, but wow. <laughs> he's not at the CFA, but uh, uh, it was a really fantastic group of scientists. Um, it's remarkable how many former students and postdocs with Lars have gone on to uh, tremendously successful academic careers. Some have gone into other fields and been very successful as well, but. I just listed here just the group that was sort of overlapping me uh, uh, while I was at CFA includes uh, you know something like uh, what is this uh, you know a dozen uh, people who are now faculty at different astronomy uh, programs in the country and that was just while I was there as a postdoc uh, the folks I was there. Um, yes <laughs> yeah I didn't I don't think Laura and I actually overlapped so <laughs> there was a, there's other waves of students who I think, uh, you know, Lars is most, for all of his scientific accomplishments, I, I wanted to, to say that I think, you know, uh, uh, many of us feel in the community that Lars's most lasting contribution to the uh, field is his sort of academic family tree and the uh, incredible number of students and postdocs that he's mentored. And when I was there, you know, uh, it looks like we're having fun here and it's because we were, and it was a really tight knit group. And uh, I was very lucky to have Lars as a scientific advisor You've set me on the course of thinking about things like simulations and galaxy formation that, that define much of the rest of my career up to, to this point. Uh, but also it was, we recognized in the group that we had something special compared to what most graduate students have. It was a really tight knit group. Uh, we were, you know, friend, friends and collaborators in a way that uh, I think is, is uh, very special. And I still am very close to, to most of these people. Um, and I think that's something that Lars really fostered in uh, many little ways, some more obvious than others, like, you know, bringing in home cooked meals and nice bottles of wine, but, but also uh, just the, the environment he provided that was very supportive and encouraged people to really interact with one another. So uh, 
I was very lucky and I just want to say thank you, Lars, for, for all of that that you provided. And uh, I won't blather on anymore. I'll let Lars uh, take it away and thank you. Oh, thanks a lot for that nice introduction, Phil. It's a pleasure to be back here after a pretty long time. I think uh, my last visit here was about 10 years ago, which seems like forever considering what's happened in the meantime. So today I want to talk about work that I've been involved with for the past eight plus years or so, trying to come up with a better understanding of how galaxies form and evolve. And this has involved a large number of people, some of whom are listed here. I wanted just to especially acknowledge Volker Springle, who wrote the simulation codes our work is based on, and also Mark Vogelsberger, Annalisa Filipich, and Reiner Weinberger, who did a lot of the modeling that the simulations incorporate. So I wanted to give just a very brief introduction, since obviously this is well known to all of you, I'm sure. But the fact is that we don't really have a complete theory of galaxy formation, even after many decades of trying. There are many reasons why we'd like so, to have such a thing, including interpreting observations of which there are many. So this is a field where the observational component of it has really led the theory component for a very long time. And it's only now that we can start to make simulation predictions that we can test observationally and use to interpret observational data. And so another application is this one here that I'll talk about a bit later in the talk. So as some of you know, there are ongoing and planned surveys to measure properties of the universe to 1% accuracy or better, including DESI, Euclid, the Roman Space Telescope, and the Rubin Observatory. And so if we want to interpret the data coming out of these surveys, we need high quality simulations and theories that we can use to actually achieve the 1% accuracy. That's the target goal of these sorts of programs. So as you all know, we have a pretty well-defined timeline for the history of the universe. Much of this is pretty well understood. The major uncertainties are really close to the beginning here, say below a second or so. And then at the end, when we see the structures that we have around us, we don't really understand in detail how these form, how do the small fluctuations present during the era of decoupling when the microwave background formed. And so that's really what this work is all about. So this field has a very long history, just listed a few of the major contributions here over the decades. Many of these were done by people here at Caltech, including the discovery of quasars. And I also want to highlight this work here by Egan, Lindenbell, and Sandage, which was the first attempt to de develop a theory for galaxy formation. So that work was done here, and their notion was that galaxies formed by monolithic collapse of giant gas clouds from the intergalactic medium. Now, if things had been that simple, if the direction of the collapse had been one in only one direction from large scales to small, we probably would have solved this problem a long time ago because the problem could have bro been broken apart into independent scales that we could have studied independently. Unfortunately, that turns out to be not true, not true, mostly because of effects that have been realized in the past 30 years or so associated with feedback from stars, supernovae, and supermassive black holes. And so that really complicates the attempt to get a um, comprehensive theory for how galaxies form and evolve. And so I like to call this the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of the ingredients that enter into any theory that we want to make for galaxy formation. So there are some good aspects to this. And that is that we know the overall cosmological model from observations of the CMB and type 1a supernovae. And so these provide us with the constituents of the universe that need to be included in whatever simulations we do, and also detailed initial conditions that we can evolve forward in time. So in principle, we can start with some well-defined initial conditions, evolve those towards the present day, and see whether or not what comes out of the simulations matches what we see in the real universe. 
Unfortunately, things are complicated, as you know, by a number of effects. One is that we don't really understand the evolution of the baryons that make up stars and galaxies, luminous parts of galaxies. And so somehow that needs to be included in some reasonable way. And this is complicated just because of the overall complexity. There are a lot of nonlinear effects going on. If we look at forming galaxies, there are no obvious symmetries we can take advantage of. And this one here is especially problematic. We have a huge dynamic range in length, mass, and time scales that we have to contend with. And finally, there's this issue of feedback that needs to be grappled with somehow. So here in this plot is just showing the number density of dark matter halos that's given to us by the standard model of the universe. On top of that is plotted the luminosity function of galaxies at redshift zero. Now, we expect that dark matter halos should contain roughly the universal baryon to dark matter fraction. And if star formation proceeded, if it's the same efficiency independent of scale, these two curves should lie on top of one another, but clearly they don't. And we think that's due to the fact that star formation, the efficiency is scale dependent and regulated by a number of these feedback processes. And so for low mass objects, we think it's mostly feedback from stellar evolution and supernovae, whereas at high mass is mostly, we think, from supermassive black holes and active galactic nuclei. And so that leads to the ugly part of this business, which is trying to make sense of how we incorporate these effects. So if we run simulations without accounting for these, what comes out doesn't look like the real universe at all. And so we have good reason to believe that things like these are important for regulating star formation and galaxies. So these includes, for example, winds that are being driven from galaxies by supernovae and rapid star formation, like in M82, and more, um, more difficult to account for is feedback associated with supermassive black holes, like in this um, classical radio jet galaxy, Hercules A. Now, what this also means is that we can't really decouple the different scales. Like I said at the beginning, if material were to collapse from large scales to small, and that was the only thing going on, we could separate the problem by scale, and it would be much easier to solve. Unfortunately, these effects mean that the small scales inside of galaxies coupled to the larger scale, both within galaxies, the surrounding gas and halos of galaxies, as well as the intergalactic medium. And so all the scales are coupled together. Furthermore, many of these processes are not that well understood. We don't have comprehensive theories for AGM feedback. So we need to adopt simplifying approximations and see what comes out in the end. And finally, because of the large dynamic range, this is essentially a nonlinear multi-scale problem, which makes it essentially computational in nature. There's no way to account for all of these effects meaningfully using any sort of analytical, pro analytical approach. And so just to illustrate this problem with scales, ideally what we would like to do would be to simulate, say, the entire universe, or at least some very large portion of it, but at the same time describe what's happening within galaxies since we'd like to understand their structure and evolution, and finally account for these effects that are occurring on very small scales within galaxies. And so if you add up the total range of scales involved at something like per linear dimension, 10 to the 13th or 10 to the 14th, something like that, and the best codes that we have currently can achieve maybe a dynamic range 10 to the six per dimension. So per dimension, we're something like seven or eight orders of magnitude short, which means in three dimensions, we would need about 10 to the 20th more resolution elements to describe this entire range of scales, which is never going to happen for a variety of reasons. So we have to adopt some alternate strategy, one of which is to cut this range in scales off at large scales and simulate some representative volume. So up to say a few hundred megaparsecs and then cut the range of scales off here not explicitly include or try to resolve these sorts of effects, but account for them as sub-resolution models. And unfortunately, that's just what we're stuck with because we can't possibly simulate this range of scales. Even if we try to do it for a single galaxy, there's no way to go from say tens of kiloparsecs down to 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four parsecs. And so there are a number of approaches that have been used to try to tackle this sort of a problem. They fall into different classes. 
the, in terms of the ones that model galaxy formation directly, the most well-known ones are zoom in simulations, like the fire simulations that Phil has been leading here, or large cosmological volumes. So this is just an illustration of the different types of simulations that have been used. Some involve dark matter only, whereas the ones I'm going to talk about include both dark matter as well as the baryonic physics. And I'll be mostly be talking about simulations that are in this class, so these large cosmological volumes. This is just an illustration of uh, showing the number of objects that are resolved in these simulations versus the resolution that's achieved. So high resolution is up here with a small number of objects, like for these zoom in simulations, whereas the simulations I'll talk about lie more in this range. So large volumes, but not as high resolution as doing zoom ins. So there are definitely compromises involved in that, but the benefit is that we can generate large statistical samples and compare the outcome to observations in a statistical manner. So this is really about two different projects, one that we called Illustrious that we started in 2014 and Illustrious TNG that superseded that a number of years later. And so they share a number of things in common. I'll talk about some of the differences later in the talk, but these are cosmological simulations in relatively large volumes that include the different constituents of the universe, the dark matter, the baryons, the dark energy, and so on. We integrate the simulations forward in time using this moving mesh code, a repo that Volker Springle developed. And the initial conditions we know from studies of the CMB and type 1A supernovae. Now to account for the physics of the baryonic effects happening in the simulations, we have to include a number of effects. So some of these are pretty well understood like the heating and cooling of gas. So when gas collapses to high density, it can radiate energy and collapse further collecting at the centers of dark matter halos to form galaxies. Now, when the gas density is sufficiently high, we have to allow for that gas to be converted into stars. So some of that is pretty well understood. You know, things related to stellar evolution and chemical enrichment, but there are many aspects that we don't understand in detail, but that still need to be accounted for if we want to do simulations like this. And furthermore, these Physical processes are not resolved directly in the simulations, so they need to be included as sub resolution models. So, things related to the details of star formation, feedback from stellar evolution and supernovae, the origin and growth of supermassive black holes, and AGM feedback. So, all those things have to be accounted for. And we've worked over the years on a number of different models for this. And I'll come back and describe those in a little bit of detail later, particularly related to AGM feedback which is the most uncertain aspect of the modeling. So I've, most of the results I'll talk about today are drawn from these illustrious TNG simulations. So they were done in a number of volumes of different sizes, 300, 150 megaparsecs across, differing in resolution, and of course, the sorts of objects that they sample given the difference in volume that these simulations cover. So the simulation data from all of these is publicly available now. You can read about this at this website and access the data if you're interested. And so for each of these volumes, we have simulations that include just the dark matter as well as the baryonic physics. So we can compare the effects of the dark matter on the, sorry, the effects of the baryonic physics on the matter distribution overall. And we have several different resolution levels so we can check for numer numerical conversions. Of these simulations, by far the most expensive was this one. It's the smallest volume, but it was the highest resolution. So just as a point of illustration, this one took about 150 million CPU hours to run to Redshift Zero. Now this is a short animation just showing some of the information that these simulations provide. So this will just scroll through one of the simulation volumes at Redshift Zero and show different information at different times. And I guess this will be it. So it's actually staying up here what's being illustrated. I guess it's a bit hard to read, but I'll try and describe this as it goes along. So this is a projection of the dark matter distribution at redshift zero. The dark matter ranges in this so-called cosmic web and dense structures form at the nodes of the cosmic web where galaxies reside. So this is the um, gas density. So gas collapses into the dark matter halos 
providing sites for galaxy formation. And we have models for how the gas should turn into stars there. This is showing the stellar distribution of ratio zero, where the galaxies actually reside. No, that, sorry, that's not the stellar distribution. I think this is the, um, the Lyman alpha emission from the large scale structure. This is the temperature of the gas. So gas collapsing to the dark matter is shock heated to very high temperatures, whereas the gas in the outlying IGM is much cooler, cooled by adiabatic expansion as the universe expands. I think this is the gas velocity field. So you can get some idea of the variation of velocity that the gas has in different regions of the simulated universe. Okay, this one here is showing the stellar distribution. And I'll show close-ups of this in a minute. But in high density regions, the dense gas can produce stars. So we form a population of galaxies that we can compare to what we see in the real universe. I think this is the metallicity distribution. So the metallicity is very high in the regions where the galaxies are located due to chemical enrichment and material being driven out of the galaxies by winds and the AGM feedback. Okay, so let me stop there with that. So as you can see, there's a lot of information in these simulations, but of course there's an issue of how we th should think about these simulations because they're based on models that are approximate and in some cases involve choices that are fairly arbitrary. But I think provided that we have to exercise caution and don't overinterpret the results, we can use these sorts of simulations to learn about what we see in the real universe and possibly go beyond that and suggest new ways of investigating things in ways that may not have been considered before. And so I wanted to give for the rest, most of the rest of the talk, some examples of how these simulations have been used in a particular focus on some that lead to new insights that might be tested observationally and you know, provide, provide motivation for uh, additional lines of research. Sorry, this one seems to be stuck. Okay, that was just the end of this video I was showing. But, okay, so one of the first results that we got from this was from the illustrious simulation. This is from a paper by Mark Vogelsberger in 2014. So like I said, the simulations allow dense gas to be turned into stars. And so we can look at the population of stellar objects that results. This is just a sample of the galaxies that emerge from the simulation at redshift zero. They can be arranged in these different classes corresponding to what we see in the actual universe. So the majority are in the form of rotationally supported disks that are actively star forming. Uh, many have bars in them. Others just have spiral patterns like these. Um, a smaller fraction are objects that are not star forming that are more spiral in shape, forming a class for elliptical galaxies. And a smaller fraction, about 10% are irregular in appearance, mostly due to ongoing interactions and mergers. So if you count up the fraction of galaxies in each of these classes, it's about the same as we see in the actual universe, about 60% of those, 30 of those, and 10% of those. And so what this suggests is that, I mean, obviously we still have to be cautious in how we interpret this, but the fact that we produce a population of galaxies that looks like the real universe suggests that we can start to use the simulations to go beyond just looking at the morphology of individual objects. This is showing a representation of a mock Hubble L3D field that Greg Snyder put together when he was a student at Harvard. So the actual Hubble L3D field is that one. The mock from the simulation is this one. They look quite similar, as you can see. They're not identical, of course. There's still some problems with this particular simulation, but just overall, they look quite close to each other. So I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the unusual galaxies. In particular, like I said, the simulation produces a population of interacting and merging galaxies. This is just a handful of uh, coming out of the simulation at redshift zero. Many of them resemble actual interacting galaxies in the real universe, like say the mice and the antennae. So for example, this one here is very close to the antennae and the overall appearance. And so what we can do with these simulations is we can 
you know, prior to this time, most studies of the interacting emerging galaxies had been done with just isolated galaxies that were idealized undergoing mergers. Here we can study these events, including the cosmological environment and the overall cosmological context. If you look at the fraction of galaxies that appear like this at redshift zero, that's like I said, about 10%, like what we see in the real universe. Okay, here's another example that comes out of galaxy mergers, so-called shell galaxies. So these were studied by Roxana Pop as part of her PhD thesis. So this is an observed, observed example of one of these NGC 3923. It's an elliptical galaxy surrounded by these arcs that are on either side of the galaxy called shells. And so we actually see a population of these in our simulations. So for example, this one here is very similar in appearance to that. It has about the same number of shells as this galaxy does, about the same radial distribution and the same property that the shells are interleaved, right? So one shell will be on this side, the next outermost shell will be on the other, then the next outer one will be on the other side and so on. Now, it's been believed for a long time, this is work that was done by Malin and Carter in the 1980s, and then studied theoretically by Peter Quinn when he was a postdoc here, that these sorts of uh, uh, fine structures are produced through mergers and accretions. But the original theory was that this was produced by say a very low mass dwarf galaxy being consumed by a much larger galaxy. And as this dynamically cold material oscillates back and forth in the potential of the larger galaxy, it can produce these arc-like features. Now in these simulations, we have the advantage of being able to dissect what happened to something like this. We can go back in time and look at the merger history of that and see if this idea that has been around for 40 years now actually is born out in these simulations. And the answer is partly yes, but partly no. So this is a kind of a complicated looking diagram, but it shows the most massive galaxies in the simulation and the ones that have um, shells have redshift of zero. So it's a population of a few dozen and the actual fraction of those at these high masses, is about 20%. Again, what we see in the real universe. And so the filled in objects are mergers that produce these shells. The open circles are also mergers, but that didn't lead to these shells by redshift zero. So the two things to notice are the y-axis is a measure of the radial velocity of the encounter. And the x-axis is the stellar mass ratio of the merger that gave rise to these features. So most of them are from predominantly radial orbits, which would be down here, which is sort of what's expected for producing these features. But the interesting thing is that most of these shell forming mergers lie in this range of mat the mass ratio. So fairly close to one to one. So they seem to be produced in the simulations mostly by major mergers as opposed to minor mergers as has been believed for many decades. And so there may be an observational test of this, right? So as you know, galaxies obey a mass metallicity relation. So if we could go out and measure the metallicity of this, the shells in this galaxy compared to the central object, there should be a higher contrast if they were produced by say, a very high mass ratio merger Whereas if the mass ratio were closer to one to one, the shells should have about the same metallicity as the host galaxy. But the fact that we produce structures like this in the simulations, I think is very interesting and reassuring from the point of view of understanding the dynamics that produce something like NGC 3923. Here's a more recent um, study. It's been done by a, a postdoc in Heidelberg Diego Sotillo's Ramos, Ramos. This has to do with this issue of whether or not disk galaxies can survive mergers. So this is a long-standing argument going back many decades. In fact, people had used this as an argument against the cold dark matter model, because in that model, we expect galaxy mergers to be very common. And so the idea was that if you have a galactic disk that's very thin, it might be disrupted by a merger, which could be a problem for the CDM model. However, these studies were mostly done with just looking at the stellar dynamical response of a merger, say a disk to a merger. Whereas we know now that many galaxies are gas rich. 
And so there could be complications due to that. So in fact, this was studied by Phil in his PhD thesis using idealized mergers. And what he showed was that if the galaxies have enough gas, that that gas can actually reform a disk after a merger. And so even a galaxy sustaining a, say a major merger can reform a disk later, which invalidates this idea that was brought forth a couple of decades previously. And so what Diego did was to look at this question in one of our uh, simulation volumes, specifically TMG50, looking at galaxies in the mass range of the Milky Way and Andromeda. And so that comprises a sample of about 200 objects by Reshia Sira. We can go back in time and trace the merger history of those objects. And it turns out that roughly 85% of those experienced a major merger at some point during their evolution. A slightly smaller percentage, around 20%, actually had a major merger just within the past five giga years of ratio zero. So in other words, even a major merger doesn't necessarily mean that disks will be destroyed. They can be reformed from the gas within the galaxy and there, the gas surrounding them. And this is just a sample of the galaxies that went through these recent major mergers that produced um, disks by ratio zero. So not all of them are direct analogs to the Milky Way, but many of them have extended disks that are still star forming that are quite thin if you look at them in projection. So this idea that mergers somehow invalidate the cold dark matter model simply doesn't work if you account for the gas that's present in and around galaxies. Okay, this is another recent study that's still ongoing. This was led by Zach Hemmler, who is an undergraduate student at the University of Florida. He's been looking at the galaxies in TNG 50, studying gas phase metallicity gradients in them. It turns out that um, we've also started to compare these simulations to IFU data that's been taken by Lisa Culey and her group in Australia. And generically, the simulations and even the observations show this interesting feature. So if you look in the centers of these galaxies, the metallicity declines outwards, roughly monotonically. But if you go far enough out, in many cases, the metallicity seems to plateau and reach a constant. And so this is an overlay of one of the simulations. Um, this is a galaxy from the simulation compared to this observed system that was studied by um, these IFU surveys in Australia. And what you can see is that both the simulated galaxy, simulated galaxy and the real galaxy show the sort of behavior of the metallicity dropping from the center and then eventually plateauing. So we can go into the simulations and understand what's happening here. And so what's happening is that this metal, this metallicity enrichment is due to in-situ star formation in the galaxy, whereas this material is being re-accreted from the halo. So material is being blown out of the galaxy mixing with the material in the halo and eventually being re-accreted by the galaxy. And because that material's um, thoroughly mixed, it has a fairly uniform metallicity. So this galaxy is basically experiencing a rain of material back onto it that has a fairly uniform metallicity, which will eventually um, lead to this plateau in the outer, outer regions of the galaxy. So this sort of study can be used indirectly for the so-called baryon cycle of galaxy evolution that involves this rich interplay between material that, that's being ejected from the galaxy, encountering gas in the halo, and eventually being recreated onto the galaxy. Now, the other applications I mostly want to focus on involve the modeling that we do for AGM feedback and how we might be able to constrain this observationally. And so, like I said, we had these two different classes of simulations, the lustrous that we did about eight years ago and the newer simulations that we've done in the past four or five years. And they involve a couple of differences, but the most important one involves the treatment of AGM feedback. So in both cases, supermassive black holes are represented by collisionless particles at the centers of the galaxies, and they can grow in mass either by mergers or by accreting gas from their surroundings. And then they release energy into the surroundings. And depending upon the accretion rate, that energy has one or well, one of two different forms. 
So in this particular class of simulations, we monitor the accretion rate onto the central galaxy. If the accretion rate is high relative to the Eddington rate, we imagine that the, the black hole is shining like a bright Aegean or quasar and photo heating the gas around the black hole itself. And so we accomplish this by adding thermal energy to the gas around the black hole. And we do the same thing in the lustrous TNG. Now, if that were the only form of AGN feedback, that wouldn't work because the most massive galaxies are relatively gas poor and the black holes in them are accreting at a relatively low rate. But those galaxies can still accrete gas from their surroundings and grow in stellar mass. So to prevent that from happening, we decide we need a separate mode of AGN feedback that operates at low accretion rates. And so in the last race, we try to invoke what we call the radio mode. So it's something like what would be seen in Hercules A, where we imagine that the black hole would produce these jets, deposit energy into the gas in the halo, and offset the cooling of that halo gas to inhibit it from accreting onto the central planet, the central galaxy. Unfortunately, that turned out not to work all that well for some reasons I'll show in a second. And so in these new simulations, we replace that. We still have this low accretion mode, but there we imagine that the black hole would be emitting a jet that stalls around the black hole, or maybe a wind from say the accretion disk that would just affect the gas in the surroundings of the black hole and deposit energy into the gas there. Now this turns out to be a much more efficient way of halting star formation in high mass galaxies by putting this um, feedback energy directly into the star forming gas within the galaxy, as opposed to this indirect way of doing the feedback by trying to prevent the halo gas from cooling. Here recently, there have been a couple of uh, classes of galaxies studied, and I'll talk more about this in a second, one of which is called FR0 galaxies that have been studied in great detail by Baldi and collaborators. Okay, this is a low far image of one of those, shows a radio map. So this is showing the central regions of a massive galaxy. What you can see is that there appears to be something that resembles a jet that's unresolved, this um, bimodal feature here. But instead of being tens or hundreds of kiloparsecs long, this is only about one or two kiloparsecs in extent. And so the idea is that the black hole would be producing the small scale mode of feedback, um, injecting kinetic energy and momentum into the surrounding gas, affecting the star forming gas within the galaxy directly, preventing it from forming stars um, after that. Okay, so th this is just showing a couple of situations where this change to the feedback model made a big difference. So this is a, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this is a, a distribution of galaxy colors, G minus R colors in different mass ranges. And it's comparing what we see from the Sloan survey to what we found in the original illustrious simulation, and then implementing this new form of feedback in the illustrious TNG simulations. So the different panels just show different mass ranges. So I'd like you to focus on this one here which is for galaxy masses around 10 to the five on um, stellar mass. Um, the observations are the blue line, sorry, the, the white one, the blue galaxies are here and the red ones are here. Now what Illustrious gave us was this uh, orange curve. You can see that it had far too many uh, blue galaxies in this mass range and not enough of the red ones. If you go to high enough masses, eventually that simulation did produce population of quenched galaxies, but the transition was not in the right place compared to observations. Whereas the blue curve here shows what we get from the new simulations. And that lies very close to what we see in the observations. So this new way of doing AGN feedback, which is responsible for quenching star formation high mass galaxies, appears to work much better than the old one, at least within this transition regime, where the galaxies are grown from primarily star forming to primarily quenched. Another situation where we can see significant differences between the simulations is looking at the X-ray emission from the halo gas. And so this is work that was done by Roxanne Apop as part of her PhD thesis. So the blue points here, this is showing scaling relations for the X-ray luminosity versus halo mass. 
And the blue points are what we got from these new TNG simulations going up to halo masses of close to 10 to 15. The black points are observational estimates for the scaling relation. And the red points here are what we had from the original illustrious simulation. So basically what we found with this extended radio jet feedback was that in order to get it to quench the high mass galaxies, it had to be very efficient at expelling gas from the central regions of the halos. And the extra luminosity goes like the density squared and is dominated by the gas at the centers. And so you can see for that form of feedback, the gas in the center was depleted. And so the extra luminosity from those halos is very smooth, low compared to the observations. In some cases by one or two orders of magnitude. Whereas the new form of feedback that we invoke uh, reproduces the observations quite well. And another interesting thing that Roxana found was that if you look at the median of these relations, there's a well-defined power law at high masses, and another power law at low masses with a break in between. And this break is due to the transition between the dominant mode of feedback, which is mostly due to stellar evolution and supernovae at low masses, and AGM feedback at high masses. You can also see this in the Sinai Seldovich effect, which he also studied. So this is one of these scaling relations between the Y parameter of the Sinai Seldovich effect versus halo mass. So if you focus on this panel here, it's just showing the simulation results, which had the error bars. And she fit these with different um, functional forms. The one that's shown here is a smoothly broken power law, which has a transition from a somewhat flatter power law um, exponent at high masses to a steeper one at low masses. And this one here is just showing the change in the power law index going from low masses to high masses. And this break here is due to this change in the simulations in the tight dominant mode of feedback, mostly stellar at low masses and AGM feedback at high masses. Now the observations have mostly probed the high mass regime so far, but they're starting to push down into group and individual galaxy scales. And so in principle, comparing those observations with the simulations here, we might be able to first of all test the model to see if this sort of break is present. And if it is, use this as a way of constraining feedback in the real systems. Okay, I wanted to move on to a couple of other examples where we can see consequences of this localized form of AGM feedback and how we might be able to test that observationally. So the idea that local AGM feedback might be able to quench star formation, I'm not sure if that's a particularly new one, but it definitely has not been very well studied, particularly theoretically. And this was studied observationally only within the past four or five years or so. So this was work that was led by Erica Nelson, who's now, she was a postdoc at Harvard. Now she's on the professor at the University of Colorado. So what she was interested in doing was studying uh, quenching um, around the main sequence of star formation in both observations and in simulations. So the first thing that she looked at was the so-called star formation main sequence. So this is a relation between the star formation rate and the stellar mass of galaxies. And as you probably know, there's a well-defined relation between the two. And so in the original um, observational studies of this, so this was done using the 3D HST survey. So the first analysis of the observations gave this red curve here, this relation between star formation and the stellar mass. And our simulations, um, both the Lustrous and TNG, gave results that follow this relation here that's somewhat lower than the observations. Now, what Erica did was to analyze the observations using a new analysis tool, a new stellar population, population synthesis model called Prospector that was developed by Joe Leja and others. And when she did that, reanalyzing the, same, the observations, it gave this black curve here. Okay, so the, you know, comparing the simulations to the observations is very non-trivial. And oftentimes you'll see a discrepancy like between this red curve and the simulations in this blue curve. And it's unclear exactly where the discrepancy lies. 
It could be a failure of the model, that's certainly possible. But in this case, this discrepancy was due to an inadequacy of the analysis tools that were used to analyze the observations originally. But when analyzed with this more sophisticated prospector tool, the observations now lie, now lie on top of the simulations. I think it's fair to say that this degree of um, correspondence is just an accident. It's probably not that meaningful. But the fact that the simulations and the observations are like this means that we can define galaxies that either rely on close to this main sequence or are far from it. And we can compare the simulated galaxies with the real ones to see how they appear, both for galaxies on this main sequence, as well as for galaxies below and above the main sequence. Here, let me skip that. So this is shown from the simulations. It's a composite image. So what we've done is taken galaxies in the simulation that are a factor of few above the main sequence, a factor of few within the main sequence, and a factor of few below the main sequence, and projected a star from main, their star formation rates um, like this. And so these are images where we've taken several galaxies and stacked them. And so if you look at galaxies above the main sequence, star formation is happening across these disks. Whereas as you go to galaxies that are on the main sequence or below, you can see that the star formation is starting to be depleted in the inner regions. In the simulations, this is due to the action of this localized AGM feedback. And so we can compare this to what's seen in the observations. So these are radial profiles of star formation both in the observations and in the simulations. And you can see that the profiles are grouped pretty well for galaxies above the main sequence and ones that are on the main sequence, and to some extent for galaxies that are also below the main sequence. So I'd like to draw your attention to the inner regions of these galaxies. What you can see here is that in both the simulations and the observations, the star formation is being depleted in the inner regions. Now we can understand what's going on in the simulations because we have control over the, the physical ingredients we've included. So what's shown here are the simulations that include this localized form of low accretion rate feedback, which is this black curve with a simulation where we simply turn that off. You can see in that case, the star formation at the center is not being depleted. So at least in the simulations, we know that this effect is due to this localized form of energy input from the black holes as they're creating at low rates. Now, that doesn't prove that that's actually what's happening in the observations, right? It could be due to something else that we're not incorporating in the models. But the fact that we see this correspondence here between the simulations and the observations suggests that this sort of phenomena is definitely worthy of further study to see if we can get some direct evidence that that's actually what's happening in the observed galaxies. And so one way of doing this may be these new classes of galaxies that have been observed in the past four or five years or so, what are called FR0 and red geyser galaxies. And so the FR0 galaxies were uh, identified in radio circuits. These are just a few examples of those. Okay, this one here resembles an unresolved radio jet. But instead of being tens or hundreds of kiloparsecs in extent, this is just one or two kiloparsecs long. Now you might think that maybe this will just evolve into something like what we see in Hercules A. But the fact is that these systems outnumber these extended radio jets by one or two orders of magnitude. So these can't be just an early stage of evolution of these extended radio jets. They may be the same physical mechanism but they represent a different kind of feedback going on. And so these authors propose that these tests are launched from the black hole, they stall in the, round, in the gas around the black hole, and impart energy and momentum into that gas, similar to what we do in a lustrous TNG. Okay, this is from, from the study by Chang et al., these so-called red geyser galaxies that were identified in IFU surveys. So if you look at these panels here, this is an example of a, a large quenched electrical galaxy that has a large supermassive black hole on it. 
So they see alpha, H alpha image from the center that they interpret as being due to gas that's being shocked by a wind that's being driven from black hole. This is the velocity field here. As you can see, it has this pattern indicative of an alpha from the, from the center. So they interpreted this as a, a wind that's being washed from the black hole, shock heating the gas around it, delivering energy and momentum into the gas around the black hole, similar to what we do in Lustrous TNG. Okay, these have been studied in more detail by a number of people, including Namurata Roy at um, Santa Cruz. So she looked at the line ratios of these red geyser galaxies and find, found that they lie in this region of um, this BP, BPD trigram. So this, the line ratios are indicative of AGN activity and shock heated gas, again, supporting the idea that these things are being caused by the black hole at the center. Another recent study is radio observations of these red geyser galaxies indicate that they're very closely related to what we see in these FR0 galaxies. So I think these represent possibly, um, you know, a way of studying this localized form of AGM feedback, the kind of loop that we invoke in the illustrious TNG. And in particular, I would draw your attention to this one here. So this is one of those FR0 galaxies and it has this on short radio jet that extends one or two kiloparsecs in the center that may be stalling in the gas around the, the central black hole. Okay, this is a montage of what these galaxies look like in optical light. And this one here is this galaxy here. Now, we see this galaxy edge on, this appears to be a spiral that's maybe actively star forming, but suppose that surveys in the future reveal objects like this, but that are re um, revealed to us, not edge on, but face on. That would give us an opportunity to study the interaction of this structure with the central gas and the star formation at the center of this galaxy. And so if we can do that possibly in the future, it might allow us to determine if this sort of loss of star formation in the center of these galaxies, in both the, well, in the observation at least, is due to this form of localized AGM feedback. So I think these systems are definitely worthy of further study. It might give us a direct handle on the impact of this form of feedback with the surrounding gas. Now, there are a couple of other consequences of this localized form of AGM feedback that are interesting observationally. So this was work that was done by Dylan Nelson showing uh, Right, this is showing the temperature of the gas. So there's a disk galaxy here at the center and the temperature of the gas. So what happens is even though the energy that's being released in this localized form of feedback is done randomly, the outflows that emerge from the galaxy are perpendicular to the disk plane because that's the easiest direction for the energy to escape. Okay, this is showing the velocity field of this material so generically, this form of localized feedback drives winds from the galaxy perpendicular to the disk plane. And so this notion was studied in some work done by Alisa Pilipic, where she looked at a sample of galaxies at ratio zero in the simulation that cover roughly the mass range from the Milky Way to the Andromeda galaxy. And what she found there was that there, in many cases, is evidence of bubbles of hot gas that exist above and below the plane of the galaxy that are produced by this localized form of AGM feedback. And in some cases, they resemble things like um, these Fermi bubbles that we see around our galaxy. So this may be a way of producing these sorts of features that we see around our Milky Way galaxy. Okay, this sort of, uh, Phenomena seems to be quite common in these galaxies at ratio zero in the simulations. This is just showing an example of the galaxies that exhibit this sort of behavior. This is the gas pressure, which is the easiest way to diagnose these sorts of features. And this is showing the extra luminosity from it. So you can see that in some cases they have this sort of uh, biconical uh, 
emission starting from disk of the galaxy. And in some cases, the features resemble very much what we see, or what we associate with these Fermi bubbles. Particularly, this is just one example. This is the stellar disk. And this is shown, this is consequence, this localized AGM feedback, the temperature of the gas above and below the galaxy plane. And the extent of these features is very similar um, to what we think are the extent of these Fermi bubbles. So this may be a way of understanding how these sorts of features originated in our galaxy. Okay, the final example I want to show is another consequence of this um, localized form of AGM feedback and the impact that that form of AGM feedback can have on satellite galaxies orbiting the galaxies hosting supermassive black holes. And so I wanted to illustrate this just diagrammatically. So what we have in the simulations are central galaxies, most of which are disk-like. And uh, we look at the satellites that are orbiting around it, and we see whether or not the satellites around the galaxy are actively star-forming or not. And it turns out that the distribution of, of galaxies that have been quenched is anisotropic about the galaxy. And we can understand why this is happening. So if we, this is just a, an overlayer um, composite of a number of these galaxies. This is showing the gas distribution around them. And so this localized form of feedback is actually depleting the density of gas in the halo of these galaxies um, perpendicular to the disk plane. So as the satellites are orbiting through this gas, they're less subject to ground pressure stripping in these regions compared to, say, the major plane of these galaxies. As you can see, this sort of effect uh, by looking at the distribution of galaxies that are um, quenched compared to those that aren't. All right, so this is just the quiescent fraction. You can see that it's uh, diminished along the minor axis and peaks along the major axis, just due to the fact that the ramp pressure is modulated by this um, localized AGM feedback um, coming from the central black hole. And so in the study, I least have compared this to what we see um, of satellites orbiting galaxies in the slow surface. And it turns out that we see a similar effect in the observations. So the green curve here is showing the simulations and the black curve is from the Sloan survey. You can see the quiescent fraction is modulated in the same way with roughly the same amplitude as in the observations. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of the talk. So I think what I wanted to do is just mention the fact that you know, the simulations I think are very interesting to the point of allowing us to interpret observations and suggesting new directions to go on, both observationally and theoretically. But there are many uncertainties in the modeling, some of which I've listed here. In particular, the most important ones are related to AGM feedback and the coupling of that feedback to their surroundings and how this feedback ultimately propagates through the galaxies into the surrounding halos and beyond into the intergalactic medium. So there's much more work to, being done, to be done in understanding the physics behind this to make the simulations more credible in terms of their physical fidelity. Now, part of an effort to try to do this, that's being funded through the Science Institute in New York. This is called the Learning the Universe Collaboration. It's being led by Craig Bryan at Columbia. And so part of this involves developing more realistic models to be incorporated into these cosmological simulations. Okay, so this is probably work that's going to be ongoing for a long time. There's much more to be done on this because there are no comprehensive theories for how this process actually works. So I think this sort of um, effort has a bright future out of it, even though the simulations themselves are starting to become somewhat mature in terms of their ability to make predictions and interpretations about what we see observationally. So just to finish, I wanted just to briefly summarize what we know of what we've concluded about the past, present, and future of theoretical modeling of galaxy formation. So like I said at the beginning, this has a long history. There have been many important advances 
particularly in the past 10 years or so, especially realizing the critical role of feedback in moderating star formation in galaxies, determining how galaxies form and evolve. And this has led to uh, the current state where we have simulations that are capable of reproducing many observable properties of galaxies and providing a framework for making testable predictions that we can use to further test the models that the simulation are based on. However, there are many uncertainties still present in the modeling, but we don't really have a full solution to this problem because of these uncertainties. And so I think the future of this field lies, especially in trying to come up with more physical sub-resolution models, particularly for things like, H like AGN feedback. And so this is an area that I think will be ongoing for many years. So there are a lot of opportunities here uh, for young people in the field, students and postdocs interested in galaxy formation and evolution. So this is definitely not a field that's solved at this point. There's much more work to be, to be done. And I think there are many interesting avenues for young people to pursue going ahead. So I hope this sort of work will be appealing to students and postdocs for many years to come. And I look forward to seeing the contributions that they'll be making in the coming years. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... We had a few extra minutes because of the time doing introductions, but uh, we'll try and just do a couple quick questions and then uh, Lars will be around all day tomorrow uh, in the building. So, Nick, you. I'm not sure this is that quick. Why we have two different feedback? Is it possible that which we're doing with the galaxies and large we get a smaller gas? Well, so we have these two different modes of feedback, this quasar mode and this um, radio, well, radio or jet mode that we invoked. And both of them are driven by accretion onto the supermassive black holes. The only difference is the accretion rate. So if the accretion rate is near Eddington, it'll be in the so-called quasar mode. But if it's much less than Eddington, it'll be in this less efficient mode. The yeah, so most of the effects I talked about with the galaxy quenching are due to this low accretion rate mode. That's simply because once the gas in the, around the galaxy starts, sorry, around the black hole is starting to be depleted, even if you had this quasar mode feedback, the accre continued accretion onto the black hole would be a very low accretion rate. But again, the galaxy is very Yeah, that's right, absolutely. So this, um, the high accretion rate mode would be associated with quasars or bright AGN. I'm, I just want to fill a point. Um, how, for the low accretion rate mode, how are you currently setting the scale of the feedback as a function of time? I mean, for example, for mass ellipticals, you still go into the halo? Or... No, so the energy is just, well, these simulations are all limited by resolution. So we're simply adding the energy in the form of kinetic energy and momentum into the gas around the black hole on scales of the resolution, which is typically one or a few hundred parsecs. But then it can, what, so what happens is you can sort of think, think, of as, think about it like as if the black hole were driving a piston into the gas and that will drive shock waves that propagate throughout the ISM of the galaxy. So that can heat the gas in the galaxy, ejecting some of it. And that ultimately allows the, or causes the gas, the star formation to be depleted throughout the galaxy. But it starts in the center. So the quenching happens from the inside out in these galaxies. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, do you have the resolution to be able to comment on what the free electron distribution would be in the halos of these galaxies, or is that just a scale problem? Well, so I mean, we track the ionization state of the material, so we know what the free electron density would be. In terms of the resolution on the halos, so the simulation technique is adapted 
in the sense that the resolution is the highest in the high density regions. So in the halos of the galaxies, the resolution is typically of order of kiloparsec or so, which for some purposes is adequate, but for many other purposes is not. So we definitely know what the free electron density is, but if you want to know how the structures appears on very small scales, we don't have the resolution for that. Yeah, well, I'm wondering is, you know, could we know, could we predict what the likely dispersion measure of a fast radio burst coming out of a, a random galaxy would be based think, on these simulations? Yes, yeah, so I think you could, subject to the resolution limitations for sure. A lot of the cosmological applications require for the hope that the DM from the host galaxy is small, otherwise it doesn't work very well. But yeah. if you could show that like 99% of it would be negative. That's very interesting. Yeah, that, that could certainly be tested, but I just don't know what the answer is. Okay. All right, well, why don't we thank Lars one more time? And again, Lars will be around in 240 Cahill all day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, those of you who are joining us at the reception can tackle him there on uh, that patio. Uh,